a lot of my work, it, both in theory and in practice, is to try to re integrate and recover a Catholic sensibility in art and architecture and even urban planning. So I, what I want to do is, is take us kind of through what I consider to be what has been lost in the past, oh, uh, probably since the 1920s, which is kind of a sacramental sense of the church building. Uh, I want to touch also on um, Catholic, uh, Catholic social doctrine, because what I want to show in the end is a new project that's being done right now in Arizona, which is a, um, a whole new village, which is centered around the church. And it's going to be kind of a Catholic faith-based community, which is meant to incorporate um, the, the full aspect of our human existence, uh, praying, worship, uh, community life, family life, social life, commerce. So I, want, so I want to kind of give a direction here for what I think the future direction of parish development in Catholic architecture is, or can be. I want to start with this idea of the, um, what do we mean when we talk about the church? And scripture talks in this kind of language of metaphor and analogy of the church as the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the city of God. And these have deeply embedded, um, deeply embedded meaning behind them. The body has to do with, member, with matters of embodiment of the incarnation of Christ. And the human person is the imago dei, the image of God. The temple, before the temple, when we talk about the temple, we want to look at images of what does it mean to dwell? What is family life? What is the, the, the family as the domestic church? And then the city as communitas, where we come together. Economics, oikonomico, oikonomics, the, the, the relationship of household, oiko is house in Greek. So it's this question of like how the house is ordered and the house in relationship to one another, the family unit in one another that forms the city, which of course is the politics, the police, the, uh, the city itself. Now the church in Lumen Gentium gives us a very interesting summation of what is the church itself presented in imagery. Scripture tells us that the church is a sheepfold, it's a flock, a piece of land to be cultivated. And there's all these metaphors of the choice vineyard, the building of God. The Lord compares himself in language of architecture, which is interesting. He's the stone which the builders rejected, which is made into the cornerstone. There's the language in scripture of the apostles being the foundation of the church. And that the, there's this house imagery, the house of the Holy Spirit, the house of God, the great and kingly house, the holy temple. And then the temple itself is also compared to the liturgy of, in the holy city, the new Jerusalem. We are living stones built into this house. John contemplates in Revelations 21, 22, of this, this heavenly Jerusalem coming down from earth, which is this very complicated, interlaced uh, symbol system of the, the, the Lamb of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the tabernacle, God dwelling with man, the bride and the groom, this nuptial relationship, becoming a city that has, it's, it's illuminated by the Lamb, who is the lamp, it needs no light because the lamb is, its, is the lamp, which is the temple, which revokes images of light coming from the temple, which is the glory of the temple that which we read in Isaiah. It's this very, very complicated symbol structure, which on one hand, which I, what I would do is kind of point out how this all works together, how we understand the church as the community, as the ecclesia, but also how this, re, this kind of symbol system works together. Now we begin with, uh, we begin with the creation. God created man and as in his own limit, image and likeness. 
And we see here the creation of Adam and Eve in this. And we see Eve here, like God has her already in mind, kind of tucked away, ready to present Eve to Adam in the proper time. But that there's something in, the, in this creation account that God has known that he was creating man in his image and likeness, and that we therefore become part and parcel of creation and procreation. Now in this garden, there's harmony. Man walks with God in the cool of the evening. Humanity is in relationship with God and relationship with all of nature. And there's this sense of unity before the fall. So it's interesting, this is a 16th century etching. This little image here is kind of interesting because it's, it's kind of a baldacchino. It's a, it's a place of dwelling, it's a place of meeting, which becomes a very important architectural element. So we see like the tabernacle, the, the Sivari or the Baldacchino at Santa Maria Maggiore is this kind of image, the same kind of image. It's a tent of dwelling, it's a place of meeting of humanity and divinity. Now we all know the account, the serpent, the apple, eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the expulsion. So all good things must come to an end. And we no longer have this close relationship with God anymore. We are now separated from direct participation, direct communication, immediate knowledge of God. And now, every, now all of our relationship with God is mediated through symbol, through sign, through imagery, through word. And this is the basis of the Catholic sacramental system, that we, as the, I think what separates Catholicism from all other uh, religions or all other faith expressions, and by Catholic I mean Catholic and the, the apostolic traditions, Orthodox Catholic, is that it is through the material that we come to spirituality. It's through the material through our bodies, through the bodies of others, through water, through bread, through the material world, that God speaks to us and that we connect with him. We do not reject the material order. We do not reject the goodness of the body. It is all good, and for us it is the only way that we get to the spiritual realm is through the material order. And that for me is kind of the basis of the sacramental system, and it, re it means that we, therefore, have to use symbols, we have to use analogy, and God reveals himself through analogy. He reveals himself through symbols. He made us a symbol-knowing, symbol-using, symbol-making people so that we can understand the deeper truths behind the material order. So after this expulsion, mankind is in a state of alienation. We, as, human, as a human community, are now alienated from God. We're alienated from nature. We're alienated from each other. Even within our fallen state, we're alienated from ourselves. Our will and our intellect are no longer working in harmony with one another. Our intellect is darkened. Our will is weakened. This is the human condition that we work in. And again, this is part of the message of, of of the sacramental order. That it is still through all of this that God, that we come to know our Lord and come to know grace, come to receive grace. So we have this condition of alienation where suddenly the human person has to create, um, this is like the difference between nature and artifice. What is natural and what is man-made. We are in a state of alienation and we have to order creation, we have to order that which God gave us in order to survive. So we see these images of, for instance, this is called, this is an image of the primal hut, the primitive hut. 
what is the first bit of architecture? Once outside of the Garden of Eden, what did we have to do to survive? So it's a very crude, rustic hut built upon some existing branches, existing trees, branches, an impluviating roof, something just to keep the rain off, something to create a sense of shelter. So this is a very primal sense of dwelling. We're, we're living now, we're creating a place of human habitation, a place apart from nature where we can have family, where we can have life, where we can be, ex where we can be protected from the elements, protected from marauding animals, where we, can, where we can start to build society. So this image, this idea of the primitive hut, kind of has always inflamed the imagination of architects. What is the foundation of architecture? Vitruvius talks about these kind of uh, foundational myths of architecture. For him, it was people first coming together to around the discovery of fire, and people are coming together around fire where they start le learning to, to talk. That the discovery of fire for Vitruvius predates language. People come together and they start talking, they start um, commerce with one another, they start developing family life, they start developing community, and all of this comes back to like the, a, very, a very primitive sense of, of the community. The reason I'm talking about this is because all of our Catholic sacraments, all of our Catholic our understanding of, of church architecture, of society, Catholic social teaching, all of this is it's prefigured and it's founded upon a much, much earlier understanding of the human community. That the sacraments didn't just come out of nowhere. They came out of a deep understanding of the human, of the human condition. So the temple becomes an important, um, the, the primitive hut is a sort of a temple. Uh, the, the, the relationship of the family as the first unit of society is, is a sort of a, the ha it becomes, um, when we talk about the domestic church or the ecclesia domestica, the house itself is the first church. In ancient architecture, the house itself was a sacred place. It was a place of security, it was a place of commerce, it was a place of family life. It's where the mystery of life itself through procreation is established. It's where death, life and death happens. So in the early, early, when we excavate um, early buildings, early cities, early houses, we often find like the bodies of the ancestors buried within the, within the building, under the threshold, under the hearth, that the building itself is a kind of a church and the house itself is kind of a, an, a shrine. It's a place of sacredness. And this is something deeply, deeply imbued in the human sensibility. So later on when, when, when organized religion develops and temples begin to develop, we can still see that basic sense of this like shed roof and the columns, which kind of harken back to that early sense of the primitive hut. Now the temple itself is prefigured, the, the house, the temple, uh, and, and um, the house, the temple, and the tent are all kind of interrelated. In the early, um, what we read of in scripture is that we have this sense of the, the tent of dwelling. Now Moses goes up to the mountain and God reveals, here's how you shall order where I will dwell among you. And Moses, and Moses is given very explicit specifications for the, for the tent of dwelling uh, and, and for the temple precinct. And this idea of precinct, the temple, the temenos, 
is an area that's cut off as a place for sacredness, just like the house is cut off as a place for sacredness. <coughs> and the interesting thing is, is that God says, you shall design it according to this pattern, which I will reveal to you. So there's always this sense in scripture that that which is revealed to Moses is the eternal pattern. It's the heavenly pattern of, of God's order itself. And so there's this sense of prefiguration and this sense of connection between the heavenly Jerusalem or the, the heavenly city, the heavenly order, and the order below. Now, the Israelites came out of Egypt. And before they came out of Egypt, there was already this established culture going back to probably 2500 BC. Moses is around 1500 BC. Okay? And he comes out of his pharaoh is Ramses II. Now this is the temple of Luxor which is uh, built by Ramses, the Rams, uh, which is built by Ramses who is the, the pharaoh who uh, Moses escaped from. And we already begin to see this sense of order and notice these two uh, obelisks out in front. This is kind of a, a very interesting piece of architecture in terms of Christian and sacred architecture because, it's, because of its historical value and also because of its, um, the connection that we have with the, New with the Old Testament of the book of Exodus. So when, so when Moses leads his people out into the promised land and they create the whole sense of the, um, the tent of dwelling that's traveling through the desert for, for 40 years, eventually it gets concretized in the time of Solomon in the city of Jerusalem as the temple. And it takes very much the same form as the ancient uh, tent of dwelling, but in a concretized, built, built of stone. And so you have these kind of interesting columns of Jackin and Boaz in front of the temple, which to me are architecturally reminiscent of these obelisks in front of the temple of Ramses. So there's, the, the point being here is that there's something going on here architecturally there's a connection between the sacred spaces of the Egyptians ordered to the east, the sense of hierarchy from the sacred to the profane through a series of courtyards that we see in the ancient Greek, uh, the ancient Egyptian temples, and the, what is again revealed uh, to David and then built by Solomon as the order of the temple. So the temple, again, becomes a very dominant theme in, in Catholic architecture. This is uh, San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice. And it becomes kind of a theme of tropes and, and, and themes and variations. This is by Palladio. And we see kind of an interesting take here where he has this like interlocking sense of temples. This was always a problem in the Renaissance, by the way. How do you integrate kind of a basilican form into a temple facade? And Palladio kind of, he figured it out first. So here you have these kind of two orders of temple. And what seems to be going on here is he has the sense of the temple of God being this higher exalted form and this temple of man being this lower squatter form that become integrated and, and interrelated. And so the temple of God imposes itself over natural order, over the, over the order of man. And this is, in a way, it's kind of a counter-reformation polemic. It's, it's, really, it's really arguing against Protestantism. It's saying that there is an integration between the divine order and the human order, that this is a sacramental place that unifies all of creation. 
The temple is such a powerful image that it doesn't matter exactly what it looks like because it's a type, it's not a model. So in the, Ren in the um, late Middle Ages, Jean Fouquet is perfectly comfortable showing the dedication of the temple, the construction of the temple. Here's Solomon overlooking the temple in the garb of Gothic architecture. Because the church is always the temple. It doesn't matter what its architectural style is. It's a deeper type that God uses to reveal um, what it means to, to, to dwell with humanity and for us to worship him. This is the uh, Karlskirche in Vienna. Again, it's a temple form. And this is dedicated to St. Charles Borromeo. So uh, von Neumann, the architect, takes again this sense of the Jacob and Boaz columns, right? And he uses them, and, but he also overlays, these are also um, like the temple of, the, 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 um, the column of Trajan in Rome. He takes that kind of heroic Roman form and he shows scenes from the life of St. Charles Borromeo all up and down these things where Trajan's column, of course, has Trajan's exploits winding all the way up these things. So, so the architect takes this kind of temple shape which goes back to the Egyptian obelisks and shows it in a new light dedicated specifically to Charles Borromeo. But this is his, his interpretation in, I guess, 18th century Vienna of the, the temple of God. Now, the city also becomes a very important form in, in, the, uh, in, in Christian architecture. The first city that we read of is Babel, which is not a good place. It's an ambiguous symbol. It's, it's a place of hubris. It's a place of, of, um, uh, of, of sin and kind of dissolution and where the human community is moving further and further away from God. So the city itself is kind of an ambiguous uh, figure in, in Old Testament. Uh, the, the Israelites at this time, and before that, Abraham um, and, and Isaac, they, they're nomadic. The, the early patriarchs are all nomadic, and they stayed away from cities. And the city becomes kind of an, a place of evil. But it gets redeemed now, this kind of shape of the Tower of Babel is, is interesting architecturally, and this is kind of a conventional, virtually every Renaissance and Baroque artist is somehow portraying the Temple of Babel as this kind of a, um, a holy mountain or a stupa or a, a ziggurat, uh, some kind of growing kind of heavy, um, heavy piece of architecture. But it's also circular. Now, what we know from recent excavations, and this is all probably within the past 20 years, is that the ancient, the most ancient piece of architecture that we would identify as religious is in modern day Turkey. It's Gobelki Tepe, 10,000 BC. This is the really the earliest part of the, um, the Neolithic age. We have a, oops. We have this kind of circular forms, which again are kind of evocative of the early earth temples. And I'm gonna get into that in a minute because this is, this is an early intuition of, that gets into um, the earth. Uh, this is a time of like earth worship, mother earth. So there's this sense of the, of like the uterus and where life comes forth. And the early temples like this tended to be cylindrical because they're being modeled on an understanding of the, the woman's body. 
So when we talk about Mother Earth or Earth worship, Mother, the Mother, the Earth Goddess, this is all again a very, very deep um, intimation of of the relationship between the human and the order of creation and life and death itself. So this is a place of sacrifice. It was a place we don't know exactly what was this. This was about. But the interesting thing about this particular building is that there's no city around it. These are nomadic tribes, or, or, or we don't really know what the order of society was, but they were yet very, very sophisticated in their art forms. These columns that they have here were all de decorated with, with imagery of animals, probably animal sacrifice. It might have something to do with hunting. It might have something to do with um, uh, um, protection against, against dangerous animals. These columns are really interesting because you can see that you have like some sort of a tiger element here, scorpions, um, various bird forms. All of, these, all of these forms have different kinds of animals. Now what, what I find intriguing about this is that if you notice, they're actually done in bas relief. Now if you look at, say, the Lausanne or some of the ancient um, cave paintings, you know, they're just applied on the wall. And then you start seeing like inscribed etched animals or etched votive figures. These are actually coming out of the, out of the, the stone. So it's a very, very advanced kind of sculpture going on already. So this is really presents a mystery because you have like this artistic community being able to do this long before we have a city, a recognizable city. So in a sense, like the temple, the temple predates the city or the community, which for archeologists is a real problem. To give you some perspective, 10,000 BC, we all know Stonehenge, 3000 BC. We look at Stonehenge as very primitive, right? But Gobekli Tepe is more distant from Stonehenge than we are from Stonehenge. So that presents a really interesting question about like the deep roots of sacred architecture and how, um, and, and so I don't offer this as a, with any solution, it's just, this is all part of the mix of how we figure out where we are in the human community, where we are with sacred architecture, where, where our faith comes from, where our sacred symbols come from. The ancient city was often circular. It was the most easily built form. It's, this is an interesting thing because here's showing the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, I'm sorry, the, the earthly Jerusalem as a circular city, even though it wasn't. This is a medieval representation. The Temple of Solomon in the center, again, a circular form, even though the Temple of Solomon wasn't a circular form. The early crusaders and the visitors coming back from the um, Middle East to Europe presumably mistook the Dome of the Rock for the temple because it was on the Temple Mount. So you get this kind of interesting idea of the circular temple, the circular city also developing. But most city planning from the Roman times on was always based upon the order of the cosmos. Now the circle, of course, is itself is an ancient symbol of the cosmos, but the, the ancient city for the Romans was ordered according to the, 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 the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, where north to south is the Cardo Maximus. And this is the, this is the axis of the earth. And the Decumanus Maximus is the major road going across east to west. That's the path of the sun. So there's like this cosmological sense to the ancient Roman city. And this pattern is found throughout Europe, 
through wherever the wherever the Romans settled, northern Africa, um, as far east as probably Iran, all of Europe was based upon this order. And at the center is where the forum would be, where the two met, the Cardo and the Decumanus met, was the forum. That's where life happened, that's where society happened, that's where commerce happened. Now the interesting thing for us is, in the faith is, why was Christ crucified? Why on a cross? And I think uh, that the cross itself was a symbol of the Roman order. They crucified, Christ wasn't the only person crucified, of course, they'd been crucifying for hundreds of years. The Persians crucified, um, because the Persians had the same cosmology, essentially. Um, and, and Christ himself was crucified on a symbol of the Roman order. All traitors against the Roman order, all usurpers would be crucified on a symbol of that order, the Cardo and the Decumanus. But for us, we know Christ submits to the Roman order. He submits to crucifixion. He submits to death on a symbol of that order. And by doing so, he overcomes that order. So there's something going on here with the body of Christ and this order that again, symbolically relates to the Roman order of the city, which is also the Roman order of the cosmos. So here we have the city of Jerusalem. And again, we see the, here's the Dome of the Rock, which was built on the site of Herod's temple and Solomon's temple beforehand. The early crusaders took this to be the temple of Solomon. So you find this kind of shape, this octagon shape, this um, circular shape, kind of starting to pervade a lot of Catholic archi or Christian architecture at the time. Okay. But is this the city of David, the city of Solomon, the city of the kings? It's a temple city. It's a palace city. Because these two in ancient times were united. There's no differentiation. This is, this is where the sacred would happen, Mount Moriah. This is the site, traditionally, of the sacrifice of Mel or the, the, the priesthood of Melchizedek. It's the site of the sacrifice, in tradition anyway, of the, um, the sacrifice of Isaac. Mount Moriah becomes the temple, becomes, um, and so, when Christ talks about the, um, his, his body as the temple, we're going to get into that. He's, he's making a connection here again between the temple, the city, and his body. So here we have another vision of the, of the heavenly Jerusalem, kind of a fantasiful idea from the 15th, 16th century. But again, we see that order of the temple, which is, Again, the same kind of model of what we see in the heaven, in the um, uh, the tent of dwelling out in the desert. It just becomes concretized with the temple itself is the tent of meeting, the tent of dwelling, with the series of four courts surrounded by kind of a precinct wall. And this is the model for <coughs> church architecture, and it becomes like a mini city within a city. It becomes a mini house within the greater house of the community. The early Christians took this idea. Here we see the, a, a, a representation of what old St. Peter's looked like before it was torn down in the uh, 16th century. And again, you have this kind of urban form. You have the temple precinct. You have the walls of the city. You have the city gates. A courtyard, which is kind of like the forum, um, the courtyard entering in and so the whole building itself is a like like a city it's arrayed with a series of smaller buildings like any city is it's a series of buildings that relate to one another in, in order so you have the bigger church you have the campanile um, the central 
uh, well, kind of the, the town well, um, which is where pilgrims would wash their feet, S administrative buildings, uh, all, the, th all the, 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 the papal palace back here. Just like any city, there's a hierarchy of spaces that are ordered in order to create a, a larger whole. You see the same model. This is a, a reconstruction of San Stefano Rotunda in Rome. All that's left now is this little circular building here. All of these other, sub, um, other parts have fallen away. A lot of people use San Stefano Rotunda as some idea that, well, you know, the early church used to gather around and around liturgy in the round and we all kind of worship together. That can't be substantiated from this building. In fact, you see this kind of cross form around a circle. And that cross in the circle is one of the most ancient hieroglyphs for a town. So again, a lot of the language that we use is in, in our sacramental language, a lot of the elements, the words, the terms, are all very, very deeply predate um, Christianity. So this idea of the heavenly city kind of inflamed, uh, the, the city itself becomes the predicate for the heavenly Jerusalem. And this is what has informed Christian architecture probably most deeply across the, 20, uh, across the past 20 centuries. The Gothic church, we know from the writings of, Durand of Durandus and Abbot Suger, it was a very deliberate attempt to build that vision in Revelations 22, the city that needs no light because the lamb is its lamp. The city of glass. And this is the, 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 the sense of the Gothic church. Now, when we talk about a city, what do we talk about? We talk about some sort of unified place that's ordered, that has roads, it has plazas, it has buildings, it has a hierarchy of buildings. The Gothic church, I think, can be likened to a city in that sense. And I think it was very deliberate on the part of the, of the builders. Every bit of, the, of a Gothic church is broken down into these little temple forms and little house forms and little building forms. So you can see like on Chart Cathedral, like these little shrines that form the buttresses, right? These are all little houses. The chantry chapels, like this one at Wells Cathedral, they're like little buildings within the city. And the whole building itself is, is likened to a city because the individual parts make up a greater whole. And we see this continuing into the Baroque age. In fact, in, various, in, in every age of Eastern and Western Christian architecture. This is St. John Lateran, the, uh, the mother church. Of, of Rome. This is the remodel by Borromini, where he basically took a dilapidated basilica that was falling down. Now, St. Peter's was torn down. Rather than tear down the basilica of St. John Lateran, Borromini basically encased the whole building in this massive Baroque stonework. So behind each of these would be a column. So he encased it so it becomes like a huge reliquary of in encasing the building. But each of these, each of these arches are dedicated or kind of terminate on one of these little edicule shapes of the apostles. And this again is a, this, so this becomes like in the sense of a city, this becomes like the house where, um, who is this? I can't read, quite read that. It must be a gospel writer. St. Matthew, Matthias. That's the house where Matthew lives within the city. 
It's his address in the city. So the whole building itself becomes this series of individual houses that each have their own kind of special meaning within that make up the greater sense of the city. And it says in Revelation that on the, the, the foundations of the stones of the heavenly city are inscribed the names of the apostles. So you see Matthew's name inscribed on the base. It's a direct like an expression. It's a very, very deliberate expression of the church as the heavenly Jerusalem. Getting into the sense of the body. Jesus calls himself, you know, St. Paul tells us we're the body of Christ. I want to explore what that means here. Because the body is kind of the primary symbol of all things. Everything that we built our symbol structure on is built upon the sense of the body. This is a votive figure, Neolithic, 3000 BC, found in Tarshin, Malta. It's a fertility symbol of a woman with the head, ample breasts, and really ample hips for childbearing. And you find this in the early Neolithic figures of kind of large-hipped women because that's what fertility, that's what life is about. Now, what I find interesting about this is it was found very close to the hypogeum in Malta, which is a series of earth temples. And these are these are, the, the, these are ancient, these are again, 3000 BC, Neolithic, around the same time maybe as, um, uh, as Stonehenge. But you can kind of see this sense of the early, the ancient temple of, of a series of courtyards or spaces that transition from the world into a series of, into like the sacred of sacreds, the holy of holies, this, but we also see these kind of shapes here of transition that when we overlay that, we see the sense of like the woman's body as a temple form. And this is an earth temple. When, you know, back in, back in the ancient times, they saw the earth as a living, um, a living entity, the earth itself. They would see crystals growing in caves. There was this sense that the earth was alive and giving forth life. So there was this immediate analogy to the body of the woman as the source of life. This again, this is the Temple of Luxor. This is an investigation done by, by Schwaller Lubitz of the shape of the human body as, as a temple order. So the, the Neolithic ancient tribes, which are prehistoric, we have no real record, we only have documents of it, or actually artifacts of it. We have some understanding of the, the Greek, uh, of the uh, ancient um, Egyptians here. But you see the consonances that are going on here between the temple and the body. So when Jesus says, I am the temple, my body is the temple. If you tear down this temple, it will be rebuilt in three days. He was talking to, I think, I think people kind of got what he was saying. We have trouble with that because we've lost this sense of the integration between the temple and the body. But for the ancients, the temple was a kind of a body. The body was a kind of a house. St. Paul talks about we have these tents that we dwell in. And when these tents, which is a transient, nomadic kind of thing, when they deteriorate, when we die, we will be built into a house, which is a permanent dwelling. So Paul talks about himself as a tent maker. I don't know. I think he is also, maybe he actually sewed tents. Maybe he's talking about, I'm actually building tents for the kingdom of God. This is part of my evangelism. 
I mean, there's these deep, deep symbolic language things that are going on, which are kind of, uh, they're fun to kind of muse on. So we have this idea of the body and how does how that relates to, to the church. We have, you come into the church through the feet, you come up the trunk, at the center where the crossing is, is where the altar would be, which is the heart. In an ancient church, in the ancient Christian churches, the, um, the transepts were where the minor orders would be, the deacons, subdeacons, and so forth. So they're the arms that are like serving. And the bishop would be at the head in the apse, governing the church, because Christ is the head of the church. So the building itself becomes a very kind of ordered expression of the body of Christ as the church, built in architectural form. For the, up until the, or certainly the Renaissance, the, the Age of Enlightenment, and then probably until the early 20th century, we had a really good understanding of the body. We see, you know, this is this Da Vinci's famous Vitruvian man, where the body itself is a, a perfectly ordered, perfectly proportioned um, presentation of the divine order where the body is circumscribed by a circle and a square, squaring the circle, that all of creation, all of, all of geometry, all of mathematics are somehow integrated into the pro proportions of the human body. This is a 20th century example of, this is Le Corbusier, the modular man. Notice the distortions that go on. This is like after Picasso, when suddenly, you know, we're seeing images of people like with noses coming out of here and eyes over here. A complete distortion of the human body happens in the 20th century. And here we see Le Corbusier trying to create what he calls the modular, which is all based upon the golden section. But you see how he distorts the form of the body to kind of fit it into his preconceived understanding of what it should be, this kind of hyper-rationalism of how architecture and order and proportion should work. So a big part of our work today is recovering, in order to recover a sense of sacred architecture, we have to recover a sense of the, 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 what it means to dwell, what it means to live in community, what it means to to have a body. We need to recover the body, which I think is a huge part of what John Paul II's theology of the body is about. That we need to understand that the body itself is a sacred place, and it's a unity between the soul and the, the, the material and the spiritual. And that what happened, what we do physically impacts what we do, what we are spiritually, and how we act spiritually impacts our body. Our bodies are important as a way, and this is, this is a way of uniting kind of the dualism of the modern age. So what does it mean to have a body? And this is where I want to kind of engage people here, okay? When we talk about a body, what can we say about the body? What do we think about when we have a body? What is the body? Give me some ideas. Pardon? It's our shell. It's our shell. Okay. An integrated organism. An integrated organism. Very good. It's after your our personal interface with the physical world around us. Yes. A mortal coil. What's that? A mortal coil. A mortal coil? It's our habitation, that's interesting. Habitation, dwelling, it's what we dwell in as human beings in the material world. Uh, together with the soul makes a person. Together with the soul, the material and the physical, the material and the spiritual make up a person. Yes? I think it's like a blessing from God, it's a word of God. Okay. Oh. Here. Oh. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So we look at the body. What do we? What can we say about it? Okay. How do we know? First, how do we? I'm going to get really kind of first grade on us here. Okay. Because I really want us to understand this. What is it? How do we know about the body primarily? Sensation. The senses. The senses. What's our first experience of the body? Desire, need. Desire, yeah. need. Breathe. What? Breathe. Breathe. Breathing? To live. To live. <laughs> we know about the body primarily as a symbol because we all have one. That's how basic I want to get. Okay? We, our first experience of our body is actually, as you said, inhabiting one, right? A very unique thing, right? Now, what the body itself is, is one thing, but it's composed of different parts. We have the hand, the head, the eyes, the organs, right? <clears throat> This is, I think, what, what Paul is getting at when he talks about, you know, the body of Christ as many parts. Right? But I think it's important to understand the language of the body and the poetry of the body and the meaning of the body. <laughs> so we have different parts. I want you to take a look at your hand. Take a look at your hand, okay? I want you to think about the, your hand in terms of four aspects. Function, form, Location and meaning. Okay? What is the function of the hand? Or what are the functions of the hand? To grab things. To grab things. Create. To create. Okay. Cook. To cook. <laughs> yes. Punch. To punch. It's a weapon. Right? To what? Eat. Eat. To eat. To feed ourselves. Right? What else? What are the functions do the hands have? To pray. To pray. As gestures. Right? What else? To interface with the rest of the world. Others, and with your eyes and other things. To touch, to grab, is only one way that we can physically incorporate other things for ourselves. So it's a prime, it's a tactile, sensate thing. Right? Yes, with the work of our hands. Right? The Lord, we ask the Lord to bless the fruit of our, or the work of our hands. Right. Yes. Like foot artists or something. Yeah. What other what other what other functions does the hand have? We've talked about. Generally, it's, it's a tool. Making music. Making music? That's something Yes. <laughs> Communication. Communication, right. Is anyone here Italian? <laughs> right, they do all these things with their hands, right? A sign language, right? Whether we... We sense with the hands. And what do we sense with the hands? What can we sense with, what are all the things we can sense with the hand? Heat, cold, what? Texture, pressure, weight, what? Yeah, viscosity, dryness, humidity in general. It's a very, very sensitive, delicate tool, right? It's a sense tool, right? And so the hand itself be, becomes, has all of this kind of intense functionality to it, right? The opposable thumb and so forth. So we can do all these things, grasping, punching, stroking. I mean, that's a whole other part of the language of communication, 
It really matters if I reach out my hand to shake your hand as a gesture of welcome, or I make a fist, right? That's another way of communicating, right? So look at the form of the hand. How would we describe the form of the hand, the shape, the elements? Look at your hand. How would you describe it? Like a tree. Like a tree? That's interesting. Yeah. Roots and trunk and branches. What else? I want to go kindergarten. Turkey. The turkey. <laughs> yes, right. Right. What about the form of the hand? The, the, pardon? It's balanced. No. It takes the measure. It's asymmetrical? Yeah, you need, you need the left hand to make it symmetrical for the right hand. That's good. I never thought about that. Because they're actually asymmetrical. They're, uh, but they're symmetrical about the center of the body, right? So each one is its own, it works in tandem. Yeah, yeah. okay, that's, I never thought about it, I like that. I, like, I love this part of the talk because it helps like, get me understanding like, everybody else's experience of their hands. I mean, I don't experience your hands, I only experience my hands, right? So what else? We have a center pad, right? We have digits. They're hinged, which allow for grasping. You know, the fingers are particularly sensitive to touch. That's where the heightened sense organs are, right? But the pad itself has, you can feel like when you're talking about viscosity and texture and weight and so forth, right? It's on, it's, it's actually hinged here. It has a whole series of hinges which allow for all kinds of manual dexterity. Aristotle actually talks about this. He talks about the fact that the importance of the hands. Who? Aristotle. Oh. And then Galen, also in the uh, late classical age, talks about the hand, that, the hand, that God, endow, or God endowed the animals with particular weapons or particular survival mechanisms, but he endowed humanity with a mind and a hand in order to solve for everything else. That we can make tools to protect ourselves with our hands. That, so there's a relationship between the hand and the mind that is kind of, it, it's, it's unique to the human condition in, in all of creation, okay? Now, what about the location of the hand? Uh, form, function, location, and meaning. <coughs> what's, the, what's the location of the hand? It's sort of the interface with the mouse. It's not that you can extend the mouse. It's something that you can bring things in the mouse or expand. It's your way of manipulating what's around you, using your mind to touch, not just with your eyes, but physically, to incorporate, to build. Exactly, yes. It's located on the end of the arm, for maximum reach, right? So we can control and we can understand nature on a more intimate level within this level, within this area. We can hear long ways, we can see a long ways. We, can, we can't really smell too far. We can't taste, you know, we, we can only like smell and taste that which is really in front of us. But the hand is this kind of intermediate zone, right? That, that allows us to, to know things, to know being outside of ourselves, right? Now, the meaning of the hand. What is the poetry of the hand? What is the symbolism of the hand? What is the language of the hand? Yeah, it's the work of our hands. What is the language? Okay, I, here, this is based upon the idea that we 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 are symbol knowing, symbol using, symbol making people. I mean, that's our human condition. 
there's a whole poetry and language to the body and to the hand, and in particular the hand, but the whole body. We talk about crossing your palm with silver, thumbs up, right? We talk about knuckling someone under. What else? Pardon? Under my thumb. A high five. What else? The middle finger. It's true. No, I mean, that's... Well, I love the cover sticker. Horn broken the finger. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. It's a way of trans. It's a way of communicating. Well, that's like, like uh, maybe the hands become, you know, something else. Right. Like ethereal, right? Yeah. I think that the hand is the first thing that uh, we put in action our mind, our thoughts. Like is the first thing that it's a free will. It's in our free voluntary, and we put in action everything that we think. So it's not. It is. Yeah. So the hand, it's, I mean, you know, again, it's sign language. You know, the part of the language of the hand, again, if I make a fist, if I do a seek heil, if I, you know, Salute. pardon? Salute. Salute, right? If I sign, wave. if I wave, if I greet you, if I acknowledge you, right? The sign of the cross. The sign of the, very good. Yeah. There, we do, there's this whole language to the hand, but there's this like symbolic, poetic language to the hand that translates to the whole body or can, applies to the whole body. We talk about, you know, bearing the weight of the world on our shoulders, having a knee-jerk reaction. We talk about keeping a stiff upper lip, looking down your nose at somebody, pulling your hair out, right? There's, a, there's just like this massive sense of poetry to the human body that gets embedded in our language, common day phrases that really are rooted. Go ahead. It's how you know the world around you. It's through everything. Without it, there is no, you can only know what's around you as well as you know what's around you through your expressions, through your senses. Yes. Through your being. If you're missing some of your sense, some of the beings, you're going to miss some interpretation of what is of, of what is around, of what you can know, what you can experience. Yes. Yeah. So the idea being, so that's what I just wanted you to think about. I, I encourage you to think about this. Just like when we talk about these terms, when we talk about the symbolic language, it comes back to the first experience of our own human body. Okay. Secondly. It comes to the experience of the other person's body. Psychologists tell us that the body is the primal symbol system and everything else is based off of that. The first thing we know apart from ourselves, typically, is our mother. The first being outside of ourselves. Typically, it's probably learned at the breast, breastfeeding that we understand there's something outside of ourselves. Yes? When we start to ask that question, it was our first experience. Um, everyone was saying all the things about sense and things like that. And so we were saying, well, the being like um, inside of the molecule, inside of another body. It's, but again? Inside of another body, our mom. Yes. That's true. And what you were just now saying, I was like, well, I was about to say that earlier. But like this tiny little thing becomes slowly, you know, grows, develops.
True. And whatever pre-memories we have of that, yeah, I mean, we can't articulate it, you know. But, it, but it's the reality of, of the human experience, right? So, again, this, this sense that we need to recover a sacramental sense of the body, of ourselves. So when we look at, like, our, we look at into the face of our mother, I think this is why we, like, we, we intuitively like symmetry. Because we're, that's what we find beauty in symmetry, in proportion, in order, that we, we first see on a very primal level again the sense of the other. And particularly, I think the mother's face, I think, becomes very, very important. I think I, every time I talk to an artist who's painting like a Madonna, they're painting their mother on one, on one level or another. I mean, they're just, you know. Maybe the Renaissance, they painted their mistresses, but I mean, a real artist is painting his mother. And I think, you know, but um, so again, function, form, location, and meaning all get translated into the sense of like the body, which becomes a determinant for understanding church architecture and the, the, the church as the body, the body of Christ. So I want to look at you know, we, we're, we're, we're obviously familiar with the uh, form of the basilica with the arms outstretched. I showed that before. But I want to show how this even works on a, non, um, a non-basilican Catholic church. This is San Vitale in Ravenna. It's an octagonal church. It has a central higher nave, uh, nave form. It has a, um, the chancel. The sanctuary kind of cuts through here with the apse. It has these kind of other forms of pastophories or little, like the diaconicon, the iconicon, where the things that serve the liturgy. So here's the shape of it in plan. And here's it in section, as if you cut through the building in half. So you can kind of begin to read the building itself, this building, as an emblem of a body, a kind of a body made up of individual parts. Each part has its own function, its own form, its own location, its own meaning. You can see the, the sense of the circularity of the, uh, the nave and the uh, side chapels and the <laughs> ambulatory around. This building was actually built about 540. At the time it was built, Ravenna, was the seat of the Ostrogothic Empire. They were Arians. Arians denied the hypostatic union. They denied the, uh, the eternity of the, log- the divine logos. This building, in my estimation, is an architectural theological answer to Arianism. How does that work? You have the sense of the imminent, the circular, enclosed, form, which is the the nave and the sanctuary and the ambulatory, pierced through with the directionality of the transcendent, the divine, this nave, the, the sanctuary form. So you have this kind of relationship where you have this sense of the body of Christ expressed geometrically. Christ being fully human and fully divine. And at the intersection of that is where the altar is. It's an incarnational building that's expressing theologically the importance of the Catholic faith against um, Arianism. And it does so in a language of very simple geometries and forms. So when you're inside the building, you can, you can kind of see how this, this big uh, sanctuary, chancel, uh, apse kind of cuts through the building. So when you're inside, you can see the big chancel arch here cutting through. And that's, so there's this kind of, again, a way of, a, a way of making an architectural statement 
about theology. But again, it's all based upon function, form, location, and meaning. Now, I, w I want to talk a little bit here about the um, Catholic social doctrine and how this relates. The Catholic social doctrines that we, the Catholic social encyclicals, before the 19th century, the, 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 pape, the Pope basically governed lots of land. These are the papal states, whoops, the papal states in about the year 1500. This whole area in blue was the papal states. And the Pope was just, he was, you know, in addition to being the head of the church, he was also, he had a, fi a fiefdom or a kingdom in co competition with the Kingdom of Naples, the Kingdom of Sicily, the Kingdom of Sardinia, the Republic of Florence, uh, you know, the Republic of Venice, okay? Through the Napoleonic Wars, the 19th century, everything changed. So that by the time of Pius IX, the Pope was basically a prisoner in, in the Vatican. Um, the Papal States had collapsed. The Kingdom of Italy had seized the whole area of what's now Rome. And the Pope lost, by 1870, with the, the birth of this, the modern state of Italy, the modern nation of Italy, the Pope had lost his ability to influence politically. Now, personally, I think it was kind of a mistake that Constantine and the Pope ever got together and kind of created this, you know, this, this mix between the world and the kingdom. I think that, you know, Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. And providentially, it's allowed the church to exist. But I think that the collapse of the papal states was in a lot of ways a very important event for us as Catholics to get out of the, as the, the, the modern world arose, we were able to get back to the core of the gospel. The only venue that the popes had at this point was their moral and political, or their, more their, their social influence, their moral and theological influence. So, Leo the Thirteenth, the the successor to um, uh, Pius the Ninth, began writing social encyclicals in order to speak to the modern world in a modern world that was radically changing. I mean, if you consider old modern nations, you know, our own nation dates back to you know seventeen eighty, um, the uh, France, Italy, Germany, they all arise during the nineteenth century. Huge changes are going on. The papal states are collapsing. And so the Pope begins to speak to the modern world through the, me through the vehicle of encyclicals. Rerum Novarum, we just celebrated, whoops. Rerum Novarum, we just celebrated, what is it, the 125th anniversary of that, I guess? Um, and and the, mm -hmm. a whole series of popes have been writing to the modern world trying to develop these, these major themes to help instruct Catholics and political leaders in how society ought to be ordered. If you haven't read it, the Compendium of Catholic Social Doctrine promulgated by John Paul the Great is a very, very good summation of that. It's, I think um, it's really worth reading. I think, have you guys done some seminars on it? I think. Um, I think that'd be a really worthy uh, project. There are a couple principles here. One of them, the primary one, is human dignity. The fundamental message of sacred scripture proclaims that the human person is a creation of a creature of God, and sees in his being the image of God in the elements that characterize and distinguish him. Again, this gets back to what we talked about before. God created man in His own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. This gets back to the, the domestic church. The family is the basic unit of society, which is something I think we today are being particularly pressed with to answer to. The modern kind of nominalist sense that, well, we can call any two people who want to get together, or any group of people to get together a family. 
No, there's something very primal and natural about the natural order of the family that we need to recover. And this is the basis of human dignity. The relationship between God and man is reflected in the relational and social dimensions of human nature. Man, in fact, is not a solitary being, but a social being, and unless he relates himself to others, he can neither live nor develop his potential. All of this is based on Aristotle. Aristotle said we need, you know, the human being can only flourish in a city, in a community. We cannot become our potential without others. We are not isolated atomic beings as the Enlightenment would have it. A recovery of the common good and a true understanding of the common good. I think this is very important today because people throw around the term common good a lot. The Democrats do, the Republicans do. Nobody can ever really define it. The church has a very particular understanding of the common good. It's the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or individuals, to reach their fulfillment more easily. Now basically what that means, when we talk about the common good, we're talking about the fabric that holds us all together. The sense of security. The common goods that we share are part of the greater common good, which is this commerce of, of stability, society, social order, civic order, that allow us to achieve our potential and to achieve us, allow us to live in harmony with one another. Thomas Aquinas says that the role of, the role of government itself is to establish and maintain the common good. It's the raison d'etre of government. If the government is not doing that, it's not a legitimate government. So when we talk about political philosophy, we always have to get back to a real solid understanding of what common good really is, which is the ability to create a, and maintain a, an order to, to all of our human interactions so that we can have peace, we can have security, we can have tranquility, we can live in harmony with one another. The common good does not consist in the simple sum of particular goods, it's not like, you know, I've got a house and you've got a house and we've got property and we've got, you know, I have this share and you have that share and that all comes together to form the common good. That's not what the church is talking about. It's not an, aggre an aggregate of material things. Belonging to each and every, each person, it is and remains common because it is indivisible and because only together is it possible to attain it, increase it, safeguard its effectiveness with regards also to the future. So this is what the church is talking about when they talk about the, the language of the common good. Okay, it's an immaterial thing. It's a, it's a social reality that government and we ourselves as individuals are called to work towards. <coughs> Universal destination of goods is one of the other pillars of Catholic social doctrine. God destined the earth and all it contains for men and all people so that all created things would be shared fairly by mankind under the guidance of temp justice tempered by charity. Today we have huge problems to solve with, with the, the problem of, of inequality or inequity, of, 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 of lack of equity. The ultra wealthy hoarding wealth, not distributing it to other people, that becomes kind of a class concern. But even it challenges us about how do we properly utilize our resources to supply for our families as well as to be charitable to others. So there's this tension within Catholic social thought between the good, of, the good and the, the real good and the necessity of private property and the universal destination of goods. And the church kind of, if you read the documents, the church kind of acknowledges is that we have to have private property in order for the family to be secure. And that's not a bad thing. Private property is not a bad thing. Um, but yet there's also this sense of charity and obligation to the world. So there's a socialization of our, there's, there's, there's a tension between the individual or the family and <coughs> The, the entire human community, that, that Catholic social doctrine 
balances or attempts to balance, which gets into the preferential option for the poor. Um, it's not just a socialist leftist mantra. I mean, that we do have an obligation in charity to, to care for our brothers, as, as Christ tells us. Subsidiarity is another important pillar. That the basic principle of subsidiarity is simply that the decisions should always be made at the lowest um, responsible and practical and effective level. That there's an order to society. There's a federal, like in the United States, we have a model of this. We have the federal government, we have state governments, we have county governments, we have city governments. And then we have PTAs and we have homeowners associations and so forth, that, that things should be governed at the lowest appropriate level. So the city, the, the, the federal government shouldn't be regulating school zones, right? They should be regulating the things that are, that are appropriate to the, to the higher levels. But where interstate, where, or maybe interstate commerce, where there's relationships going on between individuals, states, or bigger bodies, but that the principle of subsidiarity is that we as, that the more, the smaller the government, the, the more voice we have to avoid abuses and to really contribute ourselves to the common good of our society. And then solidarity. John, this is John Paul II writing. Solidarity is also an authentic moral virtue. It's not a vague feeling of compassion or sallow distress at the misfortune of so many people. On the contrary, it's a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. Because by committing ourselves to the common good, we're committing ourselves to the work of evangelization, of the salvation of souls, of the good, of the good works of charity to other people. Now, how does this all come together, these kinds of principles of Catholic social doctrine? This is, I'm gonna end here with a, this project I'm working on right now in um, Our Lady of Grace in Maricopa. What we've tried to do, and this was very deliberate on the part of the pastor, um, is, is in order to kind of enflesh the Catholic life in a, in a localized community. The problem today in urban planning and in our modern society is we don't really know what a city looks like, we don't know what a community looks like. Today we just have this kind of suburban sprawl going on. You know, an ancient city had gates, it had a, a front door, it had a, a town plaza, it had a sense, you know, it was kind of a, a sense of identifiability, you knew who your neighbors were, you had social stability, you had uh, um, relationships. Today we have these massive sprawling suburbs all laid out on these grids where everybody is living in these little isolated atomic houses, no relationship to one another. And you see that like, you know, maybe like a, a shopping center here that, you know, nobody can reasonably even get there. You, get, you need a car. It's all auto-based, right? Only the automobile allows for us to have this kind of suburban sprawl. And so you find a lot of, especially out west, you find a lot of, uh, of overexpansion. And particularly with the real estate boom, a lot of the economy collapsed on itself. A lot of these um, suburbs were built in anticipation of the people, the market crash, and these kinds of, um, you know, these houses got built, no one to populate them, the neighborhoods quickly deteriorated. So this is the context of what we were working with in Arizona, where in 2006, when the economy collapsed, 2008, the economy collapsed, this whole city had been built and, and it just kind of imploded on itself, the town of Maricopa. Now, We wanted to propose a way of solving this. And the city planners were really very, very open to, to this because they were suddenly faced with a depressed economy and a city that had this massive infrastructure 
that had nothing holding it together. Okay? It had been built of these series of like isolated master plan communities that didn't really allow for any interaction. So the goal here is to create strong neighborhoods where we live, we work, we play, we have civic, you know, civic interactions, everything happening on more of a bite-sized level. This is the town of Maricopa. It's about 30 miles south of Phoenix. It is surrounded by Indian reservation. So it's this island in the middle of the, in the middle of a, an agrarian valley, plenty of water, farmland, okay? Back about 2006, five or six major families owned all of this land, it was all farmland. And they decided, hey, let's divvy this thing up and incorporate it and become a city and, you know, sell it off and all become really, really wealthy. That was basically the plan. So they started doing that and then the economy crashed. So you can see that this is the major road. There's a freeway, uh, a freeway or a highway going out to uh, San Diego from here. This goes up to Arizona, to Phoenix. They started building these kind of suburbs that were all kind of isolated from one another. They were all master plan communities, but were, every single one of them was a single family house. No apartment buildings. Nothing for workforce housing. They were all like 1,800 to 3,000 square foot houses on little postage stamp size properties. The church was able to acquire a piece of property when the recession hit. They got this a piece of property almost in the center of, of Maricopa, the geographical center of, of Maricopa. They got 35 acres of land for about $20,000 an acre. Really, really cheap land. Right? They spun it off from a subdivision that was going bankrupt and they needed to sell this land because they, again, they started to build this thing and the population just dropped off. It's a very providential piece of property. This is the main road going up to Phoenix. This is the road going down to Casa Grande. Um, there's going to be a Banner Regional Health a hospital, major hospital here, Arizona Community College. City of Maricopa owns all of this property and is going to be the, um, the administrative center for the city. All of the shopping is right along here. They're all big box stores, the, the giants and the, you know, fries and all the big shopping centers are all along here. But the whole city is eventually going to be shifting eastward a couple miles, the city center. So the pastor and his uh, financial uh, committee, they said, let's take advantage of this. Let's make something happen here. Maricopa is one of those places that you say, uh, like as I think Gertrude Stein said, there's no there there. All it is, is these like little houses that are kind of detached from one another. We wanted to take this opportunity to make a claim on the heart of Maricopa. Just like the ancient, you know, the old monasteries, if you look in the cities in, uh, in Europe, Paris, Munich, Strasbourg, they were all originally monastic cities. Monastic, they were monasteries that became market towns, that became cities. That civilization has always followed the church. And so we have this wonderful piece of property, um, which city park nearby, um, the American Planning Association, there's this huge piece of property here, about 80, 90 acres that, um, no, it's 120 acres, I think, that the American Planning Association wants to do something with. They, they did a charrette to kind of show how it could develop. But you can see the proximity here to all this infrastructure. And you can also see the kind of infrastructure that's been built. All these roads, all these houses, Millions and millions and billions of dollars were, you know, in, in this neighborhood or this city 
that it needs a new direction. So this is the property that we bought, 35 acres, and since then we were able to acquire this, this um, about three acres here, which this is part of a floodplain. Um, so, but we are, so now the church has 35 acres, or 38 acres, and you can kind of see that they had just rough bladed in the roads, but nothing ever got built. So, they, so the, the HOA, the Homeowners Association, sold off this piece of property. The original zoning was all single family residential. There were 198 homes on it originally. Mm -hmm. We worked with the city council and the city planners to rezone this whole thing so that we kept some single family. We kept some, um, we, we created some multiple family zoning. We created some um, business opportunities. And then this blue here is what's transitional zoning, which is for the, the institutional parts of the, the project, the church and the school, any social services that are related to the operation of the church. The city absolutely wants it, this thing. And they, we, we, we had asked for certain things, and they, they gave us everything we had asked for. We should have just asked for more. But they're, they were so anxious to... Nobody else was doing anything in Maricopa, and the church stepped forward and said, we want to be a development partner, and we want to be not just... We're not here just to, you know, like a developer, come in, develop some land, sell off lots, and move on to the next piece of dirt. The city understood that the church is a permanent development partner. The church is going to be there as long as the city is going to be there. So they were very, very interested to work with us. When it, so we began applying principles of smart growth, of strong neighborhoods, of form-based codes, which I kind of want to go through, to show what underpins a, a, a new way of thinking about land and development. Uh, right now, right now, the way this building works, the way this site works, is that we have one road here, Porter, which is a major road, traffic lights, four lanes, two lanes in each direction, coming in to the property. Now, there's a little bit of, we have a little bit of a window here where we can get connectivity out to this road here, but that's all we had. We're, we've been talking to the city about future development, about creating linkages to this. This is that area, Seven Ranches, where the planning association wants to happen. And this is all just like old trailers and old ranches, and it's, it's very derelict. Um, but that this whole area is eventually going to grow well as well. And this, the, the community, the parish, wants to be part of the growth in the neighborhood. Eventually, we want interconnectivity because people need to be able to get to church and school from these neighborhoods. Now, part of the thing that was frustrating us, there's something called a, a vehicular non-access easement. It's a, it's a legal uh, designation. It's an easement which basically says between this piece of property and this piece of property, nobody can drive across this imaginary property line. Okay. When these, when these communities were developed, they were all designed with vehicular non, with, with VNAEs, vehicular non-access easements between them. So everything is separated from one another. It's like building a legal wall between properties. And the developers, in their short-sightedness, they wanted this because I guess that meant they could maximize their land. They didn't have to put a road through there. They could build right up to the, to the property line. One of the first things we did is we, we got the city to abandon all these VNAEs. They call them spite strips. You cannot drive a vehicle across there. If you have a property backing up against it and you want to put a gate in so you can get your boat in and out, you cannot do that, okay? This is just bad urban planning. We got, that, we got the city to abandon that. We're working with KB Homes here to create inter, like interconnectivity between their property so that we can get access down to here. We want to get down to here, to this road, up through here so that 
people can come to church, people can come to school, right? That there's, that the city, it becomes more of a city breathing together. We want to create principles of, of smart neighborhoods. There's a whole school of thought about how do you create places where people can flourish together. What we are faced with is, they call it Euclidean zoning. <clears throat> Typically, American cities are laid out according to Euclidean zoning. It has nothing to do with the philosopher Euclid, the mathematician. It has everything to do with the town of Euclid, I think it's in Illinois, where in a, in a <clears throat> Supreme Court decision back in the early 20th century, they determined that you can actually segregate the town into, um, like you can have, zo you can have zoning that is, the city can determine what can go on a piece of property, basically. Most of America is laid out according to Euclidean zoning, which is why you have on every major corner you'll have a shopping center, because that's the only place you can have a shopping center. And in downtown, that's the only place you can have a high-rise building. And out in the sticks is the only place you can have agrarian, and in you know everything else is suburbia in between, single-family residences. That's all Euclidean zoning. What's been going on in the past um, 20, 30 years is the development of form-based codes. The differences here are that under Euclidean zoning, the zoning type is primary. This is a high-density. Um, multi-use or multi-family property. It tells you what the setbacks are, it tells you how high you can go, it tells you what is allowed on the property. Under form-based codes, the physical form and the character of the space are the primary determinants. This would be what they call prescriptive regulation. You can only do this. The form-based developments are prescriptive. You're, we're giving you a prescription for how to create a, a sense of, of place. Kind of the code here is under convention, under Euclidean is what is not allowed is prohibited. Under form-based code, what's not prohibited may be allowed. So it's much more open to the market and much more open to, to, um, to uh, related kinds of developments. The idea of Euclidean is to create buildings which kind of stand as isolated objects in space. And the idea of Euclidean, of form-based code, is that the buildings shape the space. How does that work? I'll go through, I'll go, th move along here. One of the things that we did on this property is we abandoned setbacks and we got the city to agree to this. Typically in a building, in a building like this, uh, like this city pr probably, you can only build so close to the street. And in a lot of towns, you know, maybe you have to have like 40 feet from the street or 50 feet from the street before you can even build your building. You have these huge setbacks. They want the building set back from the road. What that does, that's an auto, automobile favored kind of development. It doesn't favor the human person. So what we did is, rather than having setbacks where you have to be so far away, we're calling, we call for build two lines and build two zones, which means you have to build closer. Okay, you have to build with, like, up to the neighborhood, to the property, you need to the street front. So what that does is, this is a typical setback for zoning with setback zoning, where you have a shopping center that's dominated by a, by a sea of parking. Whereas build two lines, here's the property line, you build the building right up against that, and that begins to define the sense of space. It gives a human sense of scale to the space. And build two zones, where maybe you have 12 or 20 feet where you're, you can build buildings or you know, dedicate to the public people to, you know, you can create like, you can create these little plazas and little setbacks where people can have cafes, street life, and so forth. So we modeled up what we call usable streets. 
They work for traffic, but they're primarily oriented for the human person. So you have nice, you know, not too broad streets, only 12 foot lanes. The narrower the lane, the slower the traffic, the more amenable it is for pedestrian traffic. Um, bike lanes, on street parking, which also helped govern the flow of traffic. And then these kind of built to um, lot lines where you see how the, how the shape of the street actually starts to create a sense of place. That's how they do it in Europe. And uh, downtown Philly would be an example of that, right? Th that kind of character. So we did this whole series of studies on how these various kinds of streets are working. Part of the doctrine in Catholic social doctrine is, is the, um, the universal destination of goods and this relationship between um, private property and, social, and public property. So we have a lot of land set aside for, um, uh, for the public use. We have a church plaza, a town square, little pocket parks, dog walk parks, village greens, sports fields, a green belt. We're trying to give as much land back to the use of the people so people can still have their own home and they have, they have a smaller property, but they have the amenities of of everybody else. So it's kind of socialization of land becomes a dominant theme. So we have these community open spaces with, with the church plaza, the town square, where you can have band shells, kiosks, because you can have community events happening right in the heart of the community. Another part is, is that the city gave us huge concessions in parking. Parking is a huge problem in, in conventional zoning. They say if you have one square foot of, of office space, you need to have one square foot of car park because somebody's got to drive their car and, you know, to get to work. So you've got to wind up with these like real strong imbalances. What we're trying to do is mitigate the, the, the car and promote the person. So we we had to take their Euclidean zoning code and do kind of an overlay on form-based code principles. So this is not what you call a form-based code. It is actually based upon a, um, uh, it's based upon Euclidean, but they gave us all kinds of concessions in terms of reduced setbacks, no limitations on floor area ratios, mitigated parking. So you can kind of see, how the city grows over time. The church, the school, we developed a series of different kinds of residences where the, the property itself is maybe a little bit smaller and denser. So they have, everyone still has a backyard, but it's a smaller backyard because they're given so much more space up front. Because one of the things we want to do is we want to pack more people on this property. The previous community, the previous zoning had 198 units, dwelling units. We have 438 dwelling units. We have over twice the density on this piece of property, which is important because the higher the density, the more you're likely you are to have commerce flourishing. If you're gonna have a corner store that's selling eggs and milk, you need a population base who can walk to that and who are gonna support that. So we actually, density is our friend in these, in these things. So we developed these kind of single family residences. Um, this is all just kind of prototype stuff. We also developed some, some more starter housing or elderly housing, smaller scale things. This is a, um, like a bungalow style house, which is a, it's a little, you know, two, three bedroom house, elderly couples, starter families. We wanted to have a mixture within the community of socioeconomic groups. And the idea of these is you have a really small piece of property, but it's fronted on like a village green. So everybody's front yard is basically this big common area where they get for socialization, for you know common maintenance. We have multifamily residences. We're, going, we're looking at you know, models of, of row houses, 
which are very, very successful. Again, you can have high density housing, but you're giving people common areas in exchange for that. The apartments are more, rather than apartment blocks, they're, they're like apartment houses. They actually take kind of a residential character to them. We also want to have ancillary dwellings so that, and this is, un, this is very un uncommon in uh, most zoning. Most zoning, if you have a single family residence, you can only have one dwelling unit on that piece of property. What this allows for is for you to have like a mother-in-law suite, or if you have a, um, like over your garage or in a penthouse apartment or something, you can have a whole other dwelling unit. So maybe you rent it out to students. You rent it out to, you know, a, a visiting nurse or something like that. You're developing a broader texture of the community, of meeting more needs of the human, uh, of the community on the property, as well as being able to have, you know, generate income for the homeowner. So economically, it's advantageous. Live work units um, are another model where people can, you can own this whole piece of property where you have maybe a storefront downstairs, which either you, you do your own business out of or you rent it out and you can live up above. This is very typical in traditional cities, not, a, not at all common in most American suburbs. And then mixed use, where you could have apartments, hotels, condos, ground floor retail, restaurants. So Our Lady of Grace is the, is, is, is the genesis of this. It's the seed beginning this. The, the, we, we set aside about five acres. Phase one is about a 500 seat church and eventually there's gonna be a social hall here. We designed it so that this whole wall blows out because we know this is the only parish that's ever going to be in Maricopa. So it's going to go from 500 seats to 1,500 seats by blowing out that wall. And we've pre-designed the building to do that. We had our dedication last month. This is the first phase of the whole project. Um, Father Marcos, from day one, he said, I want to have a Gothic church. I said, do you have 20 million? He goes, no, I got about three, maybe four. I said, what are you gonna do for that? So it's, it's, it's like on a budget here, but I think we're getting a lot of bang for the buck. Um, we had the dedication mass, uh, Bishop Kikanis dedicated, this is the only church he's ever gonna dedicate in his diocese, and he's retiring next year, I guess. So it was a, it was a grand, grand event. Um, we, we want to use really fine materials, st stone altars, beautiful tabernacle. Um, this is the, 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 uh, the rood, which was the rood beam, which was just, um, it was made down in Mexico in the classic Spanish Estefado style. Um, Father Marcus demanded that consumatumest, that's his motto for, that's his point of reference for the liturgy. It is finished. Um, everything gets designed in this building. All the light fixtures. Um, I couldn't find, I couldn't find exit signs that worked because they're all, you know, this like ugly, like, Helvetica lettering or something like that. So I went through the through the zoning code, through the building code of what lettering had to be, how thick it needs to be, what the proportions need to be, and it's all it's all regulated by the government. So I designed an exit sign that meets that in a Gothic script. <laughs> yeah, it could be a little side business. Yeah, um, this is the confessional. Every part of the building, form, function, location, meaning, every place of sacrament has its own sense of place, its own sense of form. It's a little building within the greater church, the place of sacrament, the baptistry. Um, it, it's its own sense of place, its own vertical axis, the axis mundi here, the little building 
it's a little building form that kind of speaks about the place of the baptistry within the greater church. So phase one is this initial building. Uh, we're going to start this building maybe next uh, later this year. Phase two, the rest of the site works out. And phase three, we have a whole city wrapped around the church. So thank you very much.